How long do you think this place has been here? Rogue Trader Jezebel Keel's question echoed out through the mists, bouncing away between the tree trunks. In the unnatural stillness of the forest the only sounds to be heard were those they made themselves, reflected back at them, the maze of foliage often distorting and twisting them. Jezebel Keel's question hung in the air for a moment. Here, air, air, before it slunk away between the trees like a python slipping through the murky, swampy waters. For once, Adept Cantor answered her question directly this place was built long before the genesis of humankind. For some reason the flat, mechanical hiss of his voice synthesizer did not echo in the same way. He continued, the more pertinent question is how long since this place was abandoned? The rogue trader brought up her large, ornate spyglass to her eye and surveyed the forest in front of her. To the naked eye it would look like so many mossy trees and creeping vines, but the architecture housed inside the gilded cylinder picked out, and highlighted on the eyepiece. The stonework littered throughout the undergrowth, the remnants of the elder city of Kalonor. A long, long time, she replied. Thousands of years, at least, for the forest to bury it so completely. I don't know, you'd be surprised how quickly jungle can grow. This came from Hadrian Holt, mercenary, trader collector of fine antiquities and interesting scars, and currently fulfilling a role somewhere between seneschal and arch militant. There was a patch of jungle we fought over back in the garden campaign. We set up forward bases, get pushed back by the rebels for a year or two, then when we retook them we'd find jungle had swallowed them. Hull, he hadn't been in favor of this expedition, but the Mechanicus Adept had insisted. Cantor synthesizer blew out a burst of static before his next statement. Perhaps the humidity in the air was starting to get to it. BRRZZT. But the elder do not build their cities like guardsmen putting up a few latrines. He might have sounded amused if his voice had contained any tone at all. No, I assure you that this place was abandoned before the emperor even walked on terror. Keel adjusted the straps on the heavy bolter slung over her shoulder, which she had insisted on dragging all the way through the forest. Let's hope elder technology is durable enough to survive that long. I didn't come here just for a few lumps of stonework, she said. Don't get your hopes up, said Hadrian Holt. If it's been here for that long there's been plenty of time for others to strip this place of anything valuable. I've lost count of the number of times I've tracked down a pre-imperial ruin, only to find all the architecture had been looted long ago. There are no records of previous expeditions in the Mechanicus archive, said Cantor. Nor did I glean any sign from the local records that there had ever been any discoveries in this area, at least not since the coming of the Imperium. Remember, the trail we followed to find this place is not one that just anybody could have followed. The first reference they had found had been in a trove of architecture, a database that dated from the Dark Age of Technology. It was a tiny snippet of data that spoke of a research station on the periphery dedicated to studying the Elder. It gave the human name for the planet Beresilia. It also gave the name of the city Kalonor, and it implied that the city had still been inhabited, at least partially when the report was written. From there they had combed through every archive they could get their hands on, Imperial or other, for more references to Beresilia, or Kalonor. Quite early on they had got their hands on a fragment of elder poetry that referenced Kalonor. Most beautiful of residences are those who dwell at the edge of eternity. However, it was many months before they finally found themselves on the imperial planet of Braza, a small, semi-civilized planet of no real distinction in Segmentum Obscurus, and months more before they finally identified the most likely region on the planet to contain the ruins. In the end it was neither elder poetry nor imperial surveys of the planet that led them to Kalonor, but an obscure reference book that contained a detailed study of the folklore of the common inhabitants of Braza. One entry in particular had caught Jezebel Keel's eye, on a continent in the southern hemisphere, that stretched from the southern pole almost to the equator, there was a dense, thickly growing forest that was shunned by the local farmers. They called it the Witch Forest. It had only taken a few hours in the rogue trader's personal thunderhawk to reach the region from the capital. Cantor, still trying to find clues from Mechanicus surveys of the planet, hadn't even thought it worth coming along, not on the strength of a few lines in an academic treatise on folklore. Holt had accompanied her, though, even though he'd thought the whole thing was futile from day one. He always did. They'd found nothing much at first. Just the simple rural communities that the planet's geographical databases had described, scattered around the edge of the vast, impenetrable forest. Keel had spoken with some of the locals, and been frustrated by the lack of response. None of them had answered her inquiries about the forest, indeed, such was their fear of it that as soon as she brought up the subject the conversation would be over. 
She had assumed that, whatever the local superstitions, there must be some woodsmen or poachers who were brave enough or at least hungry enough to enter the forest. But it seemed as if the locals really did avoid the forest entirely. This was a disappointment for Jezebel Keel. After two days of this she had been ready to head back to the capital. It was Holt who stopped her. Keen-eyed Hadrian Holt, her right-hand man, who noticed the smallest details she often missed. The same thing that had made him an excellent marksman and the guard made him invaluable as her seneschal. He had noticed that in some of the older farmsteads, buildings so old they seemed to be purely collections of patches and repair work, there were some stones that didn't quite fit, that looked a little smoother, that were a slightly different shade of stone grey, compared to the obviously man-made patches. While she had tried talking to the men, he had decided to try letting the buildings, ancient beyond even the farthest memories of the people who inhabited them, speak for themselves. By the time his mistress was ready to give up in disgust, tired of talking to the ignorant and standoffish villagers, he had found what he was looking for. Just a small fragment of stone, lodged in the wall of an old barn, but the pattern on it belied its current purpose. Holt recognized the motif, it was unmistakably elder. There was no chance of landing a Theodore hawk in the middle of the jungle, so they'd prepared to start the expedition on foot. Kanto had flown down from the planet's capital with the best supplies he could find, and then they'd begun their long, arduous trek into the heart of the witch forest. The Falcata, Jezebel Keel's flagship which was holding station above Braza, hadn't been able to pinpoint the location of the city with orbital scans. It had, however, been able to find an area roughly in the middle of the forest that grew more thickly than the rest, for no apparent reason. Without any better leads they had set their heading for the center of the forest. It had been three weeks before they found the place, but found it they had. Kalanor, City of the Elder, standing on a fragment of fallen statuary. Jezebel Keel surveyed her discovery. The stonework alone would pay for the expedition ten times over, despite the taboo surrounding Xenos artifacts not to mention the inquisitorial prohibition. There were aristocrats all across the Imperium who would pay well for these works, to hide away in their private collections. And if they actually found working elder technology she would be rich beyond her wildest dreams. Of course, Cantor would be a problem. He accompanied her fleet because every rogue trader needed a Mechanicus adept, but he was loyal to the Mechanicus first. Any technology they discovered would fall under his remit to collect any and all examples of ancient and alien technology for the Adeptus Mechanicus. Perhaps it would be to her advantage to let him take them. The Mechanicus would probably pay her something for them. And in any case she needed to sweeten them up if she wanted them to look the other way when it came to trading non-technological Xenos artifacts. Still, there might be things here that she would prefer to keep for herself. She would need to be very cautious, and very cunning, when it came to dealing without Cantor. She glanced at Holt, and knew that he was also thinking the same thing. At the moment, though, they did not even know if there was any technology here at all. A flock of avians, somewhere between a bird and a bat, flew overhead, shaking the rogue trader from her thoughts. She grabbed a vine and swung herself down off the statue, landing on the swampy ground. Right, she said. Let's get to work. We'll do a preliminary survey of the site before calling in the rest of the team, there were archaeologists, archaeotechnicists, xenologists and other useful people waiting back on the Falcata. But they were mostly just hired hands. Hadrian Holt was the only one of those she trusted with relevant experience, the others in her inner circle, like the astropath Bojang and the navigator Cassius Rune, were needed to keep an eye on her ship. Do we stay together or split up asked Cantor. We split up. There's no sign that there's anything dangerous around here, and the faster we work the less chance there is that someone will figure out what we're doing here. That is logical, replied Cantor. However, my sensory equipment is far more sophisticated than yours. Are you sure that you'll be able to accurately survey the area you cover? Keel lifted her spyglass. I've got this, remember. True, but I was more concerned about him, said Cantor, turning to Holt. Perhaps you should stay with Trader Keel. In any case, even if there seems to be no danger, surely it would be better for the trader to have an extra gun by her side. Don't worry about me, said Holt. My eyes are still better than anything you've had grafted onto you. And don't worry about our boss, either, she's better armed than you or me. Holt looked pointedly at the heavy bolt Akeel was carrying. Kanto paused. There was another burst of static at the start of his next statement, that could just as easily have been a cough of annoyance as a malfunction. BZZT. Very well. We will survey according to pattern for Delta, then return here, 
to this statue. When we have completed our allotted search areas, it is best that we begin quickly then. He turned to head off into the ruins. Then he turned back for a moment and said, But you are mistaken, Hadrian Holt. Trader Kiel may be more heavily armed than you, but as for me, I assure you I am very well armed indeed. One of his mechdendrites ran along the blade of his axe. Then, he turned and walked off. Kiel looked at Holt. Both of them knew that Kanto had just tried to cut the amount of ground they could cover by half, increasing the likelihood that he found find an artifact before they did. Given the direct nature of the Mechanicus, the statement about his weaponry could be a simple correction of an incorrect statement, but it could also be a warning, or a threat. Cantor almost certainly knew it could be taken either way, he wanted to indicate as subtly as he knew how that he was ready for any move against him. They watched him walk off between the trees, Mikadendrite swaying to avoid the hanging vines. Do you want me to shadow him? asked Holt. Number Keel replied. No, we don't want to risk alienating the Mechanicus, not yet, when there might not even be anything here. Just keep your eyes open, for everything Holt nodded. Okay, let's go. We can't afford to let him get a head start on us. It was surprising how quickly things disappeared amongst the trees. Jezebel Keel had scarcely walked a dozen paces before she turned around and realized that she could see no sign of Holt. With her spyglass she could just detect his body heat, moving away from her in the opposite direction. But in the humid, misty forest even that was indistinguishable from the background after a few more steps. Soon, she was on her own, and it wasn't long before she realized how disconcerting she found this. She spent most of her time on ships with hundreds, if not thousands of crewmen. Even when the course of her work took her away from her ship she was usually accompanied by her retainers. Holt in particular almost never left her side, somewhat impractical for a seneschal who was supposed to manage her business when she was unavailable, but he was an invaluable companion, even when she was completely separated from her people, however, it was almost always in an inhabited area. The last time she had been completely cut off was when she'd been kidnapped by hive gangers, an unpleasant experience, to be sure, but even then she'd been in the midst of thousands of gang members, in a city of billions. Nothing like this, where she could be the only person on the planet for all she knew. She tried her vox set, trying to raise Holt on the off chance that he might still be close enough. It fizzed and hissed, but nothing got through. They'd found that when they were a few days into the forest, the density of the foliage interfered with the radio signal. Perhaps she should have brought her astropath after all, but no, Bojang was far too fragile for a trek like this. She was getting nervous. She mentally shook herself, telling herself to concentrate on the task in hand. She was looking for elder tech. So far, all she had seen was stonework, scattered in between the roots and lying in the muddy pools. There was plenty of it. Colonel had been a big place, evidently. It might not be possible to find anything until the full exploration team was brought down. That was irritating. Keeping an eye on dozens of scientists and freebooters would be a much tougher task than handing Cantor, but it might turn out to be unavoidable. She had at least hoped to find Wraith Bone, the translucent luminescent bone-like substance. The psychoactive material that the Elder constructed their ships out of, including their vast space-going habitats, the craft worlds. In fact, less constructed than grew, bone singers would use their psychic abilities to shape the living Wraith Bone into the desired form. Jezebel Keel knew just enough about the Elder to know that on a planetary settlement they wouldn't have necessarily used it for buildings. Sometimes they preferred to use whatever materials were locally on hand, like SB some Wraith Bone, somewhere. It was ubiquitous among the Elder. Perhaps they had taken all the Wraith Bone wit when they left, the rogue trader had heard rumors that it contained the souls of dead Elder. Like much concerning those mercurial and mysterious aliens, she had no idea if this was true or not. But it would be just her luck if the former residents of this place had taken everything of value with them when they left. So far there had not been a sign of even a partially intact building. The forest had aggressively conquered the city that had once stood here, demolishing even the ancient works of the Elder. It grew so thick here she was starting to regret bringing her heavy bolter, for it was damn difficult to get the bulky weapon through this emperor forsaken forest. Then, she heard a sound. Beyond the noises of her own footsteps and the curses muttered under her breath it was the first thing she'd heard since splitting up from her companions an hour or two earlier. A hiss, like that of some giant serpent, suddenly filled the air. It was impossible to tell where it was coming from. The trees made it sound as if it was coming from all directions. It intensified, then another sound came with it, a high, piercing shriek like feedback over a vox set. 
the burst of noise caused Keel to raise her hands to her ears, then it dampened down and leveled off. She reached for her bolter, feeling the weight of it in her augmented arms. You're going to die. It was Cantor. The flat, mechanical tone couldn't be mistaken for anyone else. The static hiss was still audible in the air. You're going to die here. Jezebel Keel's blood temperature dropped a few degrees, or at least it felt like that. She never particularly liked Cantor, but she never had much of a problem with him either. He was calm and conscientious. He'd never struck her as the homicidal type. You're going to die here, and the forest will eat your bones. Just like Kalonor. He was certainly making his intentions clear. She wondered what would make Cantor turn on her like this, and then realized he must have found something. Something the Mechanicus had to have, without her laying her hands on it first. Or perhaps even something worth keeping for himself. Something worth killing over. In his position she would probably have hidden the find, then tried to smuggle it out of the forest without her noticing. Oh well, so much for subtlety. Cantor had evidently decided for the direct approach, in true Mechanicus style. At least he'd found something valuable. Extremely valuable, by the sound of it. That was good news, at least, she'd been starting to think this expedition was going to be a disappointment. You're going to die here. You will never leave this forest. Nothing leaves this forest. She wondered why he was announcing himself like that, but evidently he evaluated the psychological impact of his statements on her emotional, non-mechanicus. Mind as likely to affect her ability to reason and defend herself. Typical mechanicus, they tended to assume that anyone who wasn't emotionally dead was completely at the mercy of their basic instincts. Either way, she was starting to get an idea of where the sounds were coming from. She headed in the general direction of his voice. As long as he kept talking, she could find him. It occurred to her that that might be the point. You are nothing. You are less than an insect. Your death is inevitable as the sunset. She was getting closer. She was sure of that. Suddenly she glimpsed a flash of red robe through the trees. Was that him? There certainly wasn't anyone else out here wearing a mechanicus robe. She crept carefully forward, staying as silent as she could while armed with a weapon the size of a heavy bolter. Die. The hateful hiss of Cantor's vocal synthesizer came as regularly as her shallow breaths. Die. 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 Die still. She could not quite pin down where it was coming from. She saw movement again, and fired. Her bolt rounds cut through the foliage, impacting explosively on a large fallen tree trunk and blowing smoking craters into it. She hesitated. She'd been sure he was right in front of her, but there was no one there. Maybe Cantor had the right idea. She was getting jumpy. Suddenly a volley of bullets hit the tree beside her, spraying fragments of bark into her face. She ducked, narrowly dodging a second round that impacted just above her head. As she did so she glimpsed Cantor a little way off to her right, firing from behind the cover of a cluster of roots. She fired back through the trees, hosing down the area where the bullets had come from in a withering storm of bolt rounds. At the end of her magazine she stopped. She could still see no sign of Cantor, but there was no way he could have escaped that. She must have hit something. She made her way forward cautiously to investigate, and only then it occurred to her that Cantor didn't have a pistol. Holt did, however. Had Cantor already overpowered him? If Holt was dead, Cantor would pay. Dearly. Death is coming for you, Jezebel Keel. Death knows you. Death will embrace you. Evidently Cantor was still standing. She could hear where he was coming from, and it wasn't where she'd been shooting at. Had she misjudged where the pistol shots had come from? She must have. She turned towards. She was letting anger get the better of her. She should check what she'd been firing at first. Maybe she'd at least wounded Cantor. But either way it was poor discipline not to make absolutely sure there was nobody over there with a pistol. Ready to down her when she turned her back. She did not find Cantor. She did find Hadrian Holt. Lying on his back with what looked like shrapnel wounds in his chest. He raised his pistol at her. And her first instinct was to let off a burst with her bolter before he could fire. But instead she jumped forward and kicked it out of his hand. The pistol spun away. And Holt's hand fell to the dirt. He hadn't been bit by a bolt around directly, or half his chest would be missing, but it looked like the explosive warheads had sent a bunch of fragments into him. Sweet Emperor what had she done? She'd been sure she'd seen Cantor shooting at her. For that matter, what the hell had Holt been doing shooting at her like that? Holt. Holt. Wake up, damn you. You almost shot me. What the hell were you thinking? Jezebel he opened his eyes, and looked at her as if he was surprised to see her. Cantor said he'd killed you. I thought I was shooting at Cantor. I thought I saw him. 
Ditto, I thought, never mind, how you, do you think you can walk number said halt, bluntly, one of my lungs is punctured, and I think I've got shrapnel in my liver, maybe I could stand, with help, but I'm not going anywhere fast, Keel smiled, well, that's what you get for not wearing a breastplate, she tapped her own body armor, don't worry, I think I can patch you up, no, just help me sit up and go and find Cantor, you can't stop to help me while he's still out there, as if on cue, the dull electronic voice came through the jungle you are going to die, you are going to die soon, and there is nothing you can do to save yourself, Holt was right, of course, she had to find Cantor, first, though, she tore open Holt's shirt and quickly used a some skin spray from the media kit in her coat as a basic sealant for Holt wounds, it might stop him from bleeding out before she got back to take a proper look at him, maybe, then she propped him up against a nearby tree stump, and went off to find Cantor, the mists were so thick now she had to resort to her spyglass simply to see where she was going, the ancient artifact was able to outline the shape of the trees in front of her, but it seemed as if the mist blocked most of its other functions, she wouldn't be able to find the adept by his body heat nor, in the dim light that turned everything grey, could she alter the color shading to highlight his red robe against the green and grey background, night was falling, the days were long on this planet, and evening could last a long time, but night was definitely approaching. Keel did not like the idea of hunting Cantor in pitch blackness. Perhaps she could pick up his electrical emissions. The spyglass was sensitive enough to detect the tiny electrical charge emitted by a human body. Given how much machinery Cantor had integrated into himself, he would be giving off plenty of electromagnetic radiation. She quickly retuned the spyglass, and immediately it began picking up something. The visual it gave on the eyepiece was still distorted, somehow, the jungle even affected that. But it was there, and even if it couldn't get an exact picture she at least had a definite direction. As she was heading towards the source of the signal, she heard Cantor's voice again. You will die here. You will rot and decay. And no one will come to save you. No one. You will be alone here for eternity. You cannot escape. She wondered what it would have sounded like if his voice hadn't been that flat. Mechanical drone. For a Mechanicus adept, he seemed to be putting real feeling into his threats. Looking at her spyglass again, she realized how badly the forest distorted Cantor's voice, for it seemed to be coming from a totally different direction than the spyglass showed. That assumed, of course, that the direction she got from the spyglass was accurate. She already knew that the forest was weakening the signal somewhat. Trying to pinpoint Cantor by the sound of his voice hadn't worked for her so far, though. She pressed on. The signal was definitely getting stronger. The spyglass was even able to show her an outline now, vaguely humanoid, but still very faint. She could definitely tell there was something ahead of her. As she shouldered her way through the snaking vines she gripped her heavy bolt to just that little bit tighter in anticipation. Sorry it had to end like this, Cantor, but better you than me. Jezebel genuinely did feel some slight regret over it, the adept had been a decent traveling companion, even if she couldn't fully trust him. But he had turned on her first. With the spyglass she could see there was a knot of roots up ahead. Cantor seemed to be standing in front of it. The outline on the spyglass's viewer seemed to be standing in one place, yet the edges were blurry as if the figure was moving as well. At this point, Jezebel could hear the low hiss of static well enough to decide that the figure the spyglass was leading her to definitely was Cantor, and not like some figment of the device's imagination. There was movement up ahead. She could sense it. Cantor was close. She was half tempted to open up again with the bolter and blast Cantor before he even saw her coming, but she had made that mistake once already and didn't want to take chances a second time. Plus she didn't have unlimited ammunition for the weapon. She still kept her finger on the trigger as she approached, though. Then she saw Cantor, for real, standing there beside the tree roots. Elder stonework littered the area, as she walked forward she stepped over what must once have been the outstretched arm of a colossal elder statue. Keel was puzzled. She had expected Cantor to attack, or at least try to flee, but he just stood there. The familiar mechanical shriek came again, and Cantor said, There is no escape. There is no escape. There is no escape over and over he repeated those these four words. Yet otherwise he made no move whatsoever, he stood as if rooted to the spot. Something was very strange here. Cantor the rogue trader called out, It's me, Keel. What are you doing she came a little closer, and then she realized what was missing. She could see any of his macadamite, which would normally be waving around above his shoulders. 
she raised the spyglass to her eye again, and switched off the electromagnetic sensor to give as clear an image as possible of what lay in front of her. Cantor wasn't standing by the roots. He was tied to them, by his own macadendrites. They had also bound his arms to his side. He was helpless. Kiel could see through the spyglass at the adept's one remaining organic eye was wide with alarm. Jezebel Kiel set down her bolter and drew her sword. There is no escape. You will die here. There is no escape. You will all die here. She ignored the steady litany of doom as she strode forward, sword in hand. It wasn't a power sword, but it was molecularly bonded titanium tungsten alloy, as tough as it was sharp. When she got close enough two of the macadendrites unwrapped themselves and struck at her. She deftly deflected them, then severed each with a well-placed sweep of her blade. Another tendril started to unwind, but she cut it off before it could come at her. This allowed Cantor to get his right arm free, and he began tearing in the rest of his mechmandrites, trying to pull them out. No longer able to contain Cantor the tendrils switched to attacking him, and for a few moments it was as if he had fallen into a nest of angry serpents. But Kiel's sword and his own mechanized hand soon finished the job. Cantor looked down at the last of his macadendrites as it lay twitching on the forest floor. Then he reached up to his voice synthesizer with both hands and with a gut wrenching pull tore the whole apparatus away. It fell to the floor, and he brought his heavy foot down on it, grinding it until the last of the static had ceased. Kiel was shocked. She had never seen Cantor without his face mask before. He turned to look at her, and she involuntarily took a step back. His mouth had no lips, it was just a red, ragged hole, and all his teeth had been surgically removed. His tongue had apparently been left in place, though, for he opened his mouth and said, with difficulty, Thank. You. The words were accompanied by a wet cough, as if the speaker was unused to forcing air out his lungs. You're welcome. It was all Kiel could think of to say. Then she added, Cantor, what the hell happened to you? I lost control of my augments. Something overrode. The sentence was broken up by a coughing fit, but Cantor continued. Psychic, Link. All other implants are directly wired, but my macadendrites and my vocal synthesizer are low-grade psychic connections. You're saying there's a strong psychic presence here that overrode your control of your own implants Keel asked. Shouldn't be possible. But, yes. Can you feel it? Jezebel Keel concentrated for a moment. Now that she knew what she was looking for, she could sense the slight buzzing in her skull that indicated psychic activity. She wasn't particularly psychic herself, no more than the slight latent intuition that most people had. But unlike most people she'd run across enough sickers in her time to get a good idea of what psychic activity felt like. You're right. It's there. It's so generalized you wouldn't notice it, though. This whole area must be blanketed in one vast psychic field. It's so spread out we didn't notice it building up, but now we're at the center it's so strong. Maybe the strongest field I've ever encountered. What the hell could be causing it? Cantor seemed to think about this for a moment, then he picked his huge axe. Keel tensed, still on edge, and still under the now noticeable effects of the psychic presence, which was still plucking at her fight or flight response. But Cantor didn't swing it at her, instead, he brought it down on one of the tree roots, splitting it wide open. From inside the root there came a faint, white light, wraithbone, whispered Keel. Cantor nodded. He cut away some more of the root to reveal the translucent white material in the center of the woody fibers. The forest was not the only thing that grew out of control. When the elder abandoned Kalanor, Cantor observed. Do you think the tree is growing around the wraith bone, or do you think the wraith bone is growing inside the tree? Relationship to form. Despite the circumstances the Mechanicus Adept sounded fascinated. He also. Symbiosis, perhaps? The Elder left their city thousands upon thousands of years ago. There has been time for a seem to be getting used to using his vocal cords again. I suppose it doesn't really matter. We need to get the hell out of here before it tries to kill us again. I think I can feel the presence getting stronger. In fact, I think this was only the beginning. We've disturbed it, and now it's waking up. We need to get as far away as possible, because if I'm right it won't be long before it won't have to resort to tricks. It'll simply fry our brains and our skulls. You are right. This place is hostile to us. We have trespassed. Perhaps the Elder intended this, to keep others away from their treasures. Oh, I think this is more than a security system. This place is angry. Really angry. Wraithbone doesn't have a mind of its own anyway. I think the Elder abandoned this place in a such a hurry that they left someone behind. A lost soul with no other place to go. Stuck in the city's Wraithbone. Can you imagine being trapped here? 
for eons, with no body and no company and no way of leaving, ever, holding on to the faint hope that one day your people might come back for you, but knowing they've almost certainly forgotten you, that you're stuck like this for the rest of eternity, Kanto considered this for a moment, we need to leave, now. Where is Hadrian Holt? He's over that way, somewhere. I shot him. You shot him? Long story. He was alive when I left him, but we're going to have to patch him up before we can get moving. If he's badly hurt then, as a matter of simple mathematics, I would suggest leaving the one of him to save the two of us. But you will of course, ignore logic, and under the circumstances I do not feel like arguing over it, so let us go to him and make what repairs we are able to. They found Hadrian Holt propped up against the tree stump where Kiel had left him. He was barely conscious, but he saw Cantor and tried to get up. Calm down, Holt, said Kiel. As it happens, Cantor hadn't turned on us after all. It's the forest trying to kill us. Oh, said Holt weakly. Um, what? There really isn't time to explain right now. We have to get out of here as quickly as possible, before it succeeds. Are you up for a little battlefield surgery? Do I have a choice we could go off and leave you? Maybe you should. Maybe, but we won't. Then laser scalpel was already in Jezebel Keel's hand. Holt didn't even ask for an anesthetic. He was already past feeling much of anything. Keel worked quickly. A couple of times she felt as if someone was trying to jog her hand. Trying to make her cut deeper than she meant to. But she was aware of the presence at the back of her mind now. And wary of it. There was no time to remove the shrapnel, but she managed to get into the wounds and seal up the blood vessels that had been severed. Then she disinfected the wounds and recovered them with some skin. A stim shot woke him from his daze, and Keel and Cantor between them got him to his feet. Now all they had to do was actually get out of the forest alive. What do we do now Halt murmured as Keel and Cantor manhandled him through the trees. We can't go forward with the expedition now. If we get out of here, what will you do now? Rogue trader Jezebel Keel considered this for a moment. She hadn't thought that far ahead. It was a bitter thing to give up a prize this fine, but the sensible thing would be to accept her considerable losses and forget about it. She had no way of dealing with a problem like this herself. But since when did a rogue trader do the sensible thing? If she couldn't extract a soul from Wraithbone herself, she knew where there were those who could. We contact the Elder. Maybe they'll do something about this. It might just have been her imagination, but she thought she felt the forest stir. And maybe if they do, they'll leave something behind for us. Maybe. Maybe they would die here first. But maybe, just maybe, it was now in Kalonor's best interest to let them go. Then again, how rational was an ancient, imprisoned alien soul likely to be? One way or the other, they had a long way to go. And if they didn't move fast, the witch forest would claim them yet. Oh, I love these picture, like, improv stories. You know, there's something about them. Like, you know, I love the idea of, you know, just looking at a picture and then from that one picture you build like, this big, huge story. So then, like, okay, it doesn't have to be huge, but, you know, you're making it up on the fly and I think there's something, I don't know, I really enjoy that. Like, you know, there's something really cool about that. And, like, you know, what the bit that really got me was, what, are you at the end of this, they're actually going to do something sensible in the 40k universe? What? Like, someone has some fucking sense. Right, okay. Okay, like, you know, so, look, Eldar, like, you know, like, they're the masters of Trekly and all that, and there's a good chance they might not leave them something, but they would clear out this whole area that would let it, like, you know, that the Imperials are, like, you know, have been avoiding, like, the fucking plague. It gives more room for, like, you know, Imperial expansion at the very worst. So, you know... Eh, you win some, you lose some, you know, there was a chance of it all, but, you know, you don't always get it, you know, like, you know, let us know what you think, like, you know, or do you think, like, you know, could you come up with a story like this just from this one picture? I don't know, I love it, like, you know, I, I really enjoy listening to what people can do, and I love reading these stories, there's just something really cool about them, I don't know, I, I like, like, you know, that's all I could really say, but hey, also, um, if you enjoyed the music, um, I host on my second channel, this 24-7 Synthwave live stream, like, you know, I think it's pretty call something to maybe look into if you enjoy it i think it's a really nice leading music it's a nice background like you know music and i enjoy it you know so maybe i like to think if i enjoy something then you guys enjoy it too to a certain extent so you know there's always that um but no as always um i hope you guys have enjoyed like and subscribe if you want to stay up to speed well and any and all further videos um 
Yeah, that's about it. I'll see you soon. Um, not as many videos this week as normal. I've got a few bits happening, but like, you know, I'll try and upload what I can. If you haven't already, check out my Redbubble portfolio. You might just find something you like. This, this is, is not okay. This needs to stop now. This is cancer. This, this is so much cancer that I can feel the tumors growing on my back. And it's way down heavy on me, and it's not okay. Can you help a nigga out and just stop this? Please?